morning. Good morning. Good morning. Looks like a good amount of folks are here. So we're going to get started. We got got actually quite a bit of ground to cover this morning. Um, here in, in Ecclesiastes chapter seven. This chapter is kind of the last chapter where where the teacher. Remember, I'm not the teacher here. The teacher is who wrote this. I'm just repeating what the teacher taught. The teacher, Koaleth, Solomon. Um, this is going to be the last chapter where he is kind of looking at things and exploring things and thinking about things. Starting next week through the end of the book, chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, he's going to move into kind of practical how-tos about life. So we've, we're, we've spent the first seven chapters kind of examining life and all of the inconsistencies and chasing the wind and all that. And starting next week, he's going to begin to say, okay, now let's put this into practical, how do I live, how do I go about life type of things. So we're gonna, gonna get cranked up on this, see what these last things that Solomon is going to examine and, and move on from there. Uh, Paul, would you open us this morning? Sure. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the privilege of gathering here as your children to study your word. And we pray that you give Pastor Harry the wisdom and guidance that help us to understand how much you love us and how you have taken care of us and this, these historical perspectives, Lord, on showing us that relationships haven't changed over the last 3,000 years. And so, Lord, thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you'll see the lesson title this week is Don't Take Yourself Too Seriously. Amen. Absolutely. Which, which is a good thing in and of itself because a lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people tend to take themselves just way too seriously. And then that just causes more consternation than, than anything else. But Solomon's going to look at that. We're going to look at wisdom. And we're going to look at some a couple of other things. But let's kind of review chapter 6 real quick. No amount of what can make up for a life without joy. Prosperity. No amount of prosperity. You can have it all. You can be super rich. And if you have a life without joy, you have nothing. Um, in all of my trips to Africa and a lot of times in working out at the villages and now Stephanie my oldest who's with us today um, did not she didn't ever get to go but three of her siblings uh, all have and we saw you saw poor in a manner that you've never seen there are no poor in America <laughs> globally speaking but I oftentimes would see more joy in those villages who had nothing comparative than I see in entire villages of the United States. I would go in and worship with them at a small room half the size of this, made out of mud block. And the joy and the singing and the worshiping that went on in that little room would oftentimes leave me in tears. Um, so no amount of prosperity can make up for a life without joy. And that's one of the things that Solomon looked at last week. He also kind of figured out that there is no what kind of satisfaction. There is no permanent satisfaction. Uh, yeah, there's there's a song on that one. <laughs> but how many times do people try to find permanent satisfaction? All the time. And clawing and digging and say, and then all of a sudden it's not there. And Solomon was wise enough to realize, you know what? It just it isn't. And you might as well kind of consider that that. Because even when you do hit satisfaction, what tends to almost immediately happen? Yeah, you start drifting down again. You want more. You want more. I want something. Or you know, how do I maintain this? And and life just does not maintain. 
Solomon also examined the idea that there, it's better to be satisfied with one has with what one has than to be continuously driven to obtain even more yeah. as a way to obtain what? Yes. Happiness. Yeah. Trying to obtain more, is that going to make you happy? Yeah. No, but do are there millions of people on this planet that think if I just get a little bit more, then I'll be happy. If I just get this, then I'll be happy. If I just get this, then I'll be happy. But that goes right back to the last point that Solomon realized that there is no permanent satisfaction. So even if you get it, and you are happy for a minute, then what happens? <laughs> and finally, from last week, Solomon, in all of his writing so far, and we're actually we're going to see this through the entire book, Solomon is really looking for, and this is true of really all people, Solomon is looking for a long-lasting what in life. What's he looking for, really? Meaning. Meaning. What does my life mean? I, I read some, there's a, a web page and it's the last words of all kinds of famous and infamous people. And um, oh, who was that singer that we were talking about the other day? His last words was, it was all, one of, one of the What a waste. What a waste. Uh, 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 the Partridge family. Um, David, David, Cassidy. David Cassidy. What a waste. His final words, right before he died, was, what a waste. Yeah. That was his last words. That's his last words. And he was the, he was the teen heartthrob of the 70s, cutting all kinds of records. Had, you know, knew, everybody knew him. Fame and fortune. Fame and fortune. He had it all. But what he lacked was meaning in life. And his last words were, you know what, my life turned out to be meaningless. And, and his... His final analysis of his own life stated in his last words, what a waste. Solomon, too, was looking for meaning in life. We're all looking for meaning in life. But thank goodness God gave us his word and says, here's what the meaning to life is. I can give it to you right here. Today, in this idea of not taking us, ourselves too seriously, we're going to really look at moderation. And the, the whole concept of moderation, which is kind of foreign to Western thinking, and particularly American thinking. But moderation is not merely a Jewish or a Christian value. In the ancient Greece temple of Apollo at Delphi, it had the inscription, Medin Agam, nothing in excess. So even the ancient Greeks had begun to figure that one out. And right there on the temple to Apollo said, you know, nothing in excess. Figure out, and of course, what's our, what's our common phrase in our society? Living your best life. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how many more do you need, Dad? <laughs> yeah, one more. <laughs> what I need, I just need one more. <laughs> yeah, of everything. <laughs> Doing something in moderation means not doing it excessively. A better understanding for Christians is that moderation is balance. It includes concepts like self-control, one of those things that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Self-control. But at the same time, some things are always wrong, such as murder. There's no amount of moderation of, well, this is just a little killing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody saw that one. Yeah. And, and there, it should not be done even in moderation. You know, we're not going to do murder in moderation. Some things like denying ourselves, taking up the cross, and following Christ may appear to be extreme to the unsafe person or the immature Christian. And despite differing slants, the principle of moderation is a very useful concept, especially when understood as seeking God's balance to things. Because balance means obeying God. And when we're obeying God, we will find our life is in perfect balance. The great philosopher Lindsay Lohan... <laughs> who is a mess, <laughs> said this, my motto is 
Live every day to the fullest in moderation. Okay. I said the great philosopher Lindsay Lohan. That concept and those two ideas are really incompatible. If I'm going to live my life to the fullest, I'm not going to live in moderation. Every day can be very meaningful. Every day of our lives can be meaningful, but not necessarily to the fullest. That concept is even being taught in some churches, where you'll hear phrases like, live your best life now. And my response to this is, if this is my best life, then <laughs> I know what my best life looks like. I can read about it in the scripture, and I can't wait to get there. But this is not my best life. Moderation, the right balance of things, serves us really well. Moderation should be our starting point when making our decisions. It shouldn't be our where we get to, okay, well, it should be our starting point even including those very minor decisions of life. If I'm starting with the position of how I'm going, how can I moderate this between this and this and find that, that good balance in my life, all of a sudden then. And that, of course, goes to everything. Diet. <laughs> everything. So, and we'll get more on that. We're going to see where Solomon really talks about moderation a little bit later in the lesson. So with that kind of as a background thought running through our head, let's get into the book of Ecclesiastes. Now remember, we went through the first four verses last week because they're really tied in with the end of chapter 6. So we're going to start in verse 5, and I need a good reader. It's going to be long. Verses 5 through 14. Go ahead, David. And then we'll, we'll pick all this apart. So chapter 7, verse 5 through 14. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the cracking of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Ex extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing, and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both right. of these. Hold on. Oh, just through 14. Oh, just 14. You're good. Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to see here is really, again, we've, and we've seen all through the book so far, is Solomon likes to talk in Proverbs. These nice little pithy statements that are then used as teaching tools. Of course, we also know that he wrote a great deal of the book of Proverbs itself. So this is, we begin to, this is how Solomon thinks and talks in putting concepts into these nice little bite-sized things that we can get a hold of. And we have eight of them to kind of look at in, in these verses. Now, the first two, verses 5 and 6, relate equally to what we saw last week in the first four verses of chapter 7 about how important it is for someone to confront their own mortality. To look and say, you know what? I am going to not be here forever. I was talking with my... Yesterday we had a, a family wedding shower for my niece. So, of course, it was all hands on deck getting this wedding shower put together and decorated. My wife was in charge of most of that. And, you know, with all of her... And we had... My wife collects wedding dresses. We have them from 1900 through, you know, 2000. And so we have all these mannequins. We've got those displayed and decorated the table. But I've got my 
niece-in-law decorating and my sister-in-law putting pashimas on chairs. You know, it's just this flurry of activity. Everything's going absolutely nuts. And I was talking with my brother-in-law, and I said, you know what? I, I, I turn 65 next month. Medicare, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, considering the crap insurance I have now and what I'm paying for it, I'm actually going, yes. <laughs> I get more and pay less. Yes. Um, but I said... If I, if I just go with my, my parents' lifespan, if I turn out to be like that, I have 10 to 15 years left on this planet. And I'm done. Now, I may be like my grandfather and live to 99. I don't know. But the most recent generation, my parents, we're in the late 70s. So I said, wow, that, that's a rather sobering thought, but it's also good for me to focus on that fact that I'm not gonna be, and what am I doing? What am I preparing myself? How am I preparing my children, even though they're all adults and, and four out of five are married and, and three out of five have kids and all this. What am I doing to prepare them still because I'm still their dad? What am I doing to prepare for my wife, you know, all these things. And so it's a good thing to confront our own mortality. And so with that, with that in mind, having written that, now he writes this. The heart of a wise, uh, it is better to listen to rebuke from a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Now that word rebuke is the same word used in Proverbs for the grave admonition which heals and strengthens while it wounds others. Proverbs 17.10, also written by Solomon, says this, A rebuke cuts into a perceptive person. A rebuke cuts into a perceptive person more than a hundred lashes into the back of a fool. A perceptive person hearing that rebuke particularly if it's coming from a person who loves them and wants the best for them, brings more to them than if you were to take them out back and just whoop them. And he compares that with the smirking laughter where it says the song of fools. Because, and that's their response to the advice of the wise. Yeah, right, old man. What do you know? This is the 2020s, dude. It ain't the 70s. <laughs> of course, I may remember a teenager in the 70s that said to his father, dude, this ain't the 50s. <laughs> and so it continues. And the fools laugh because in their eyes, the wise man's rebuke is empty. <clears throat> they think, you've got no idea what you're talking about. Like, the idea that people and things change. But now having read Ecclesiastes for six weeks now, how much have people changed since Solomon wrote this somewhere around 3,000 years ago? Have you all been able to see yourselves in the last six weeks? Clearly. <laughs> yeah. Same. So to get the idea that, oh, you don't want to talk, yeah, I do, because people don't change. The, the, the minuscule details around change, but the way they think, what they're going after, what they want in life, how they deal with rebuke, all that, none of that changes. The simile that he follows up with that, I love, in verse 6, For like the crackling of burning thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This too is futile. This too is meaningless. I love that word picture. The simile portrays the fool as both worthless, like a bunch of dried out thorns, they're not good for anything, and about to be quickly destroyed <clears throat> under a burning pot. The thing is, how effective is burning a bunch of dried um, thorns? Like gasoline. Yeah, they go poof, 
And then when, and how long does the fire last? Um, we don't have that type of plant here in Arizona much, but if you've ever been out camping and you get your fire started with a bunch of dried pine needles, how fast do they burn? They burn quick, they burn hot, and then they're out. If you really want to cook something under that pot, what do you need? You need you need piece of wood. <laughs> you need a log. You need something where that, that fire is going to be there for a long time. And then even as the wood burns up, it, it breaks down to embers and it's still putting off more heat. Because really, those thorns are worthless as they flare up and burn up and go. If you want to see the same word picture, and I have it noted for you at the bottom of your handout, Psalm 118.2 or 12. They just don't sufficiently heat the pot. Poof, the fire's there, and then it's gone. And that's the word picture that Solomon uses to say, here's how fools look at the, the wisdom or the rebuke of a wise person. It flares up, ha -ha, poof, and then it's gone. So with that word picture in mind, as he moves on, he, Solomon says, you know, it's really difficult to follow the path of wisdom because of all of the obstacles that come up against him. Some man-made. Sometimes God allows us stuff. Sometimes it's internally. We put up our own obstacles to wisdom. And he looks at two of them being extortion and bribery. And he says there in verse 7, surely the practice of extortion turns a wise person into a fool. Because extortion can make a wise person into a fool by showing that his advice is wrong. If I'm forcing you through some sort of extortion, now we often tend to think of extortion and bribery on the grand scheme, don't we? Politicians, particularly. Maybe corporate execs. But does extortion and bribery happen on the day-to-day -day with normal people? Oh, All the time. Sometimes parents are big into this. <laughs> Trying to manipulate their kids through extortion or bribery. I have. <laughs> but essentially, Solomon says, you know what? That just turns a wise person into a fool. If you can't as if you're wanting to be wise, if you can't figure out how to get this done without using extortion or bribery, essentially you've shown yourself to be a fool. And likewise, by the acceptance of a bribe, Solomon says that wisdom is corrupted. If I'm willing to take something, then all of a sudden, okay, how wise am I what is my advice going to be like? If I'm willing to change my position based on something that I get, where's the wisdom in that? Does wisdom care about how much you get? Wisdom is. It just is. It's like truth, which I hate that phrase that's out there right now. Well, this is my truth. <laughs> there is no my truth. There is no your truth. There is just truth. And everything else is a lie, even if it's really, 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 really close to the truth. <laughs> so wisdom is corrupted by a bribe because now all of a sudden, okay, the wise decision is to do this, but if you'll give me this, I'll go ahead and do this. I'll change my position. The oppressive ex ex er, exercise of power can be so demoralizing that even the wise man Skilled in statecraft, oftentimes can lose his wisdom. We have the old adage, power corrupts. Yes. <laughs> and what's the, abs what's the second half of that? Power power Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And time after time, and I, I'm, not, I'm not smacking politicians around here particularly, but they're just, they're just the easy target. <laughs> But way too many times, and we'll have a politician that comes up and gets elected, and boy, he or she is just looking like, and they are initially, they're just, 
they're just going for it. I've got these great ideals, and you pour for them. Say, yes, that's what I want to see happen. And then after a few months or a few years being surrounded by the corruption and the bribery and the extortion and whatnot, and all of a sudden you watch them begin to keep farther and farther away. And Solomon looks at all that and says, wisdom cannot stand if either of those two are present. Now, and like I already pointed out, these don't have to be on the grand criminal scale. That's just an easy one to look at. They are most often seen in the very small things in our individual lives. Things that others place in our lives in an attempt to influence us one way or another. That would be either a bribe or that might be an extortion. Hey, I'd really like you to do this and you know I'll just kind of forget that you said this that one time or that you posted this or where I saw you that night. We'll just forget that as long as you'll kind of, which is an extortion. And it's those small things in our lives that often is the far more damaging to wisdom. We always can point at it on the grand scale, but where is it involved in our life? So is that when you take the guy and say, well, let's go talk to the manager about this right now? It can be if the idea is to force somebody to change what they're doing to accommodate you. Not necessarily. Sometimes it just, hey, y'all screwed up. <laughs> but if it's if it's an attempt to manipulate and get people to change for your benefit, then absolutely, that's yeah. that's a that's a type of extortion. Yeah. And we can all be both extorters, extortees, bribers, and bribees. <laughs> we have that capacity as everyday citizens. It's just easy to point to the the big dogs in power. And then kind of forget that, wait a minute, that stuff's involved in my life. And Solomon is writing for the everyday person here. In verse 8, we, see, we get another proverb. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. And then a, a second proverb, a patient spirit is better than a proud spirit. So we get two proverbs, two of those, one, those pithy one-liners that he's trying to teach us something with. So in verse 8 and 9, first off, he notes that the final verdict isn't in. And people often prematurely conclude that the warnings to avoid corruption are very <coughs> naive. Well, that, that won't happen to me. I'm a good person. I love Jesus. I read my Bible almost every day. <laughs> And this, can, this couldn't possibly happen to me. And then in that second one, he says that if one is patient, one will finally see that moral integrity is indeed the better way. A patient spirit is better than a proud spirit. Anybody besides me struggle with patience? <laughs> Well, good. The rest of you didn't. Hold up your hands, liars. <laughs> it's mine and I'm wanted now. Yeah. Yeah, or if you answered verbally too. But yeah, struggling with patience. And he said, a patient spirit is better than a proud spirit. What does a proud spirit focus on? Every time. Um, when I got to speak on love last week, and we looked at that. From a scriptural back, from a scriptural background, and how God loves, what does love look like? It's an action. It's an action. In fact, is it's what kind of an action? It's a sacrificial action, and it's focused on somebody else without any regard to me. And that requires patience, because as I've told you before, people are rascals. Yes. <laughs> And people say things and do things that upset us and they don't do it when we think they should do it and all that sort of thing. And Solomon says, you know what, that patient spirit is much better than a proud spirit because it's going to get me a lot farther down the road. 
If one is patient, one will see that moral integrity is the better way. And at the same time, in verse 9, don't let your spirit rush to be angry, for anger abides in the heart of fools. So this is the flip side to that whole patience thing. I just wanted to make a comment on yep. eight. The end of a matter is better than the beginning. It's always been one of my favorite verses because it sort of reminds me that no matter how, how you screw up, how bad things were in your life, if you develop wisdom and you listen to people, uh, the end will be much better. I mean, I've always looked at it that way. Am I wrong? No. No, okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, you're spot on. What do we, but of course, what do we focus on? What's it look like right now? And God says, wait a minute, hold on, be patient, look at the end of things, and how many times have you been involved in something you thought was a real mess, and now, now you're in a place where you can turn around and look back and go, oh, okay, all right. But man, my hair was all on fire, and I was going nuts at the time. And in verse 9, he continues that idea by saying, don't let your spirit rush to be angry. For anger abides in the heart of fools. To allow oneself to be really bothered and grief-stricken over corruption in the world is also foolish. Because it leads to anger. And what does anger solve? Nothing. Pretty much nothing. Have we seen a lot of anger by one group or another in our country in the last year or two? That's what we see. Have we seen a little bit of anger in our friends to the north recently all over the news? Yes. And what does anger accomplish? Absolutely nothing. Don't let your spirit rush to be angry, for anger abides in the heart of fools. What did we also learn from Solomon two weeks ago? When, when we see corruption and stupid decisions high up in government, are we supposed to be shocked? <laughs> and going, oh, I can't believe that those leaders did this. In fact, just what did Solomon tell us? Don't be surprised. It's going to be there. And then if, if we're not surprised and we're expecting it, then why would we result here in anger? If we already know it's there, if we already know it's coming, if we expect to see it, when we see it, then what should our reaction be? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Which goes back to now being able to be patient. Because, again, who's in control? Who is Solomon seen in control throughout all of this? God's in control. He has set up this time. He'll, he's setting up the next time to come. He's in control of it all. And now all of a sudden, I can be real patient going, all right, well, God's got this. Yeah, they're being knuckleheads. But I don't need to go all nuts and start grabbing signs and say, Arr! because that's not going to accomplish much of anything anyway. The patient in spirit is the person who knows how to check and control their speech and listen to correction. who can get that rebuke that we talked about back in verse 5 from a wise person and say, you know what? There's something there. Maybe I do need to make a course correction here. You know what the most common phrase is, though, to correction from somebody else? But. It's two words. Well, but is one. There's one in front of it. No. No. It's yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cindy and I say that all the time. Oh, yeah, that, that person's a yeah, but. <laughs> you tell them something, they go, well, yeah, but. And then they fill in the blank of why it doesn't apply to them. Or why their circumstances are different. Or why they should be able to go ahead and do this. Or they should not be, they shouldn't have to do that. And it always starts with those two words. Yeah, but. Parents, think about this. How many times have your kids started with the terms, yeah, but? 
Now, think about your own life. How many times has somebody talked to you and you started with, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, but um, let me justify why it's okay for me in this situation. You see. <laughs> so don't let your spirit rush to anger because that abides in the heart of fools. Listen to the rebuke of a wise person. Consider it. Is there something there? Is this God talking to me through somebody else? Verse 10 is a kind of a transitional proverb, but it's going to continue. It's going to take us from these concepts and move us to the next one. Verse 10 says, Don't say, Why were the former days better than these? For it is not wise of you to ask this. Yeah, the good old days. Exactly. They never existed. Yeah. And it's pointless to look back to the good old days when corruption didn't seem to be so common. Because you know what? It was there then. And the more you study history, you realize it's always been there. But we look back, oh well, back in those times. No. Back in those times, they just didn't have the internet, so when it got caught out, it wasn't spread as fast. But we were younger. It wasn't as confrontational to us as when we're the parents and the adults. All of that. And Solomon says, you know, don't look back. That's, a, that's, a dumb, that's a, even a dumb question. Well, what, what happened to those good old days when, when everybody just got along and we all sang Kumbaya up and down the block where we lived? <laughs> In fact, this is really an inappropriate question. Because God has ordained the times to be exactly as they are for each of us. You are not in where you are by accident. Every detail of your life has come through God's hand. Every detail. Including those that you didn't like and that are really, really, really uncomfortable. And they are for each of us to be in the situation he's placed us in. And this really anticipates what's coming next. It's foolish to long for the days of prosperity. Because remember, this is a kind of a transitional problem. We're going to be talking about what was and moving into this next line of thinking. So it's, it's dumb to think about, well, I used to have... In, in my life now, now that I'm... <laughs> Retired. <laughs> and I thought, and every once in a while I talk about, man, if I needed some more cash when I was a police officer, I would just sign up for another off-duty job. Or I would, I used to bank all of my overtime and not get paid, and I could hold it in a bank. And then if I needed some money, something came up. I could put in a slip, send it over to fiscal, and on my next paycheck, I could cash in 20, 30, 40, 60 hours of accumulated overtime and get this big wonking check and take care of whatever it was. Now, I had worked those hours. I, I was able to pay, but I, I could hold it interest-free. The city didn't mind that at all. <laughs> and, but then when I needed it, it was there. And now that I'm retired, I don't have that. Nobody pays me overtime. Well, they pay you over time. They pay me over time. <laughs> and there isn't, I can't just go sign up and go grab an extra job for a day or two and come up with a couple of hundred, couple of hundred bucks that, boy, I just, I need something right now. It's just not there. But it is foolish to look back on those days of prosperity and think, wow, weren't those great? Because apart from the fact that such longing doesn't do me any good, every period had its hardships and its opportunities. There are opportunities out there for me now if I'm, if I'm smart enough to find them. 
But I had all kinds of hardships back then. And the thing was, God just provided for them. Now, I don't have those hardships. I don't need the provision. But I'm also confident that if I face those again, God has always been faithful in my life to then come up and all of a sudden it just happens. So with that transition, he goes into some other thoughts here in the, these last of these eight Proverbs in verses 11 to 14. And Solomon's going to look at wisdom and wealth. The wise person must know how to confront prosperity and deprivation, the cycles of boom and bust. Verse 11, wisdom is as good as an inheritance and an advantage for those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection as money is protection. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of its owner. Verse 11 acknowledges that even, the, even a wise person prefers prosperity to poverty. <laughs> yeah, if I'm given a choice, you can be very prosperous or you can be really poor. You know what? I'll choose prosperity almost every time. <laughs> because though, and Solomon says, both the person who has wisdom and the person who has financial resources, prosperity, both are under the protection of each of those concepts. Because if you've got just a ton of cash and something comes up, what do you do? All right, write a check. Slide my debit card. Done. Wisdom, though, Solomon says, is the superior of the two because it can guide you through difficult times while money miraculously, uncontrollably, seems to just disappear right when you need it the most. Yeah, <laughs> Generally, not always, and Solomon's already examined that, but, but what he says is that wisdom will now figure out a way to get through the situation other than the mindless writing of a check. And he also saw that all too often, right when you need money the most, all of a sudden, somehow, it just doesn't seem to be there. And I, when I say need it the most, I mean need it the most. It can't be counted on. This last week in the market, we've seen the stock market just go. <laughs> and people have lost, now it's paper money, but people have lost thousands of dollars in their portfolios because the market went. And they didn't do a thing. And so if they were happened to cash in their portfolio on Friday, as opposed to two weeks ago, their portfolio said being like this was only like this. That's like when we get the paper statement. Dan goes, no, don't open it. <laughs> 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 we don't want to know. <laughs> and the wise person must know how to confront both prosperity and the lack of it. Based on everything we've re just read, Solomon comes to some conclusions in verses 13 and 14. Consider the work of God, for who can straighten out what he has made crooked? In the days of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, without question, God has made one as well as the other, so that man cannot discover anything that will come after him. See, verse 13 reminds us that God is in control of the times. He's in control of your time, whatever that is. And nothing can be done to resist his will. And verse 14 really clarifies that this is to be understood kind of primarily in an economic context. Solomon is talking economics here. God has ordained your time. Maybe you're sitting on top of the world right now. Maybe everything you, you know, you're, you're in a place now where you've never been. Maybe not. But either way, God has placed you in that place intentionally. God brings both prosperity and recession. So when times are good, 
Solomon says we should enjoy the prosperity. But when times are bad, we should reflect on the fact that this is also from God's hand. The prophet Jeremiah in his the book of Lamentations said this in Lamentations 3 verse 38. And he gets to the exact same conclusion as Solomon. He said, do not, do not both adversity and good come from the mouth of the Most High? Don't they both come from the exact same mouth who speaks everything into existence? Lamentations 3.38. It's on the bottom of your page. And Job said, the Lord giveth and all. The Lord taketh away. Mm -hmm. So numerous people through the Bible have come to realize this, that, you know what, I, I, I am where I am because God has allowed me, he has placed me there, and the book of Romans tells me that if I've been placed there, what, what is it? It is for my good. good. Even though I don't like it, it's uncomfortable and I hurt. <laughs> so those are those eight Proverbs. And with that in mind, this next section is on moderation. So give me another reader, verses 15 through 22. Go ahead. So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, before you get that, here's the closing thought to that wisdom as well. Um, if we don't have any idea if tomorrow will bring wealth or disaster, we can find peace if we accept that we know it's all coming from God's hand. Mm -hmm. Which goes back to that patience thing. You're beginning to see the circle in, in Solomon's thinking. If I know that if I get great prosperity tomorrow, if I'm walking through Fry's parking lot and I find a, a scratcher ticket sitting on the ground that somebody dropped, and I scratch it all off and it's a $10,000 winner, Oh, all of a sudden, man, he's giving me prosperity. Or if I go home and I open the mailbox and here's a couple of surprise bills that I had no idea were coming. Or if I'm driving home and my transmission suddenly goes out of my car and all of a sudden I'm going, oh man, where's that money coming from? <laughs> In either way, I know that it's come from God's hand. Then I can find peace. So... With those concepts in mind, let's go on to now look at the concept of moderation. So, <laughs> chapter 7, verses 15 through 22. Gotcha. Okay, so it's uh, 15 through 22. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked loving, living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. For uh, whoever fears of God will avoid all extremes. Keep going to read 22. Yeah, through 22. Um, it says, Wisdom makes one man wise, one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Mm -hmm. Pay not attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. <laughs> For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. Ooh. <laughs> right? Talk about truth. Okay, Solomon just wrote to Levinites, 2022. <laughs> With everything that we've seen so far, Solomon now advises moderation in all things. He, he understands that God has a time and a place for everything, and people can only do their best in their time and place. Knowing that they can't alter anything, and probably won't ever even understand the why of it all. Why did this happen? There's a good chance you're not going to understand the why of it all because Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, has looked at things. And what have we seen in the first six chapters? How much did he understand about the why of it all? No. He said, you know what? I just don't get it. And he got it. He understood more things than anybody else. 
And he said, the, the overall thing, I just don't get it. Life is full of mystery. He said he sees righteous people dying early in their righteousness. Good people doing good things, living for the Lord, living a righteous life, and then dying. They got cancer. Somebody killed them. Some weird thing. And yet I see wicked people that just seem to keep. They're like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep going and going and going. And he said, why? you have a question? Well, she asked me, she said that, what does it mean when you die in your righteousness? Sure. Basically what he's saying, here's a good person who's doing good. And everything about you, look at, this is a person who's living a righteous life. And now all of a sudden, they're done. Dion Kelly. Dion Kelly. Out driving around, a, a godly man, and only he's younger than me. <laughs> he's got years to live. He's serving the Lord, you know, in, in a quiet background way, doing what he's supposed to be doing. And gone. And yet, there are knuckleheads out there that just keep going and going. And Solomon says, I, I, I don't get this. Verses 16 to 18 really stress the concept of moderation. And of course, we see that in the story of Job. Job's friends got it wrong. In the story of Job, we, and we often join them in trying to see what happens in the here and now as somehow being related to how we're doing our life. If we conduct ourselves well, then we should, I deserve, <laughs> This nice, prosperous, long life because, Lord, you know. You know. And yet, we don't always, that doesn't seem to be a direct correlation. Solomon's conclusion is the extremes in any direction are the wrong way to go. Now, let me give you a side note here. The exertion to be not over-righteous or over-wise in verse 16 is not telling us to do a little sinning in the name of moderation. <laughs> That's not what he's saying here. Well, okay, just go ahead and do a little sin. That way you balance your life out. That's not his point. Solomon is dealing with the issue of personal sins, but he's concerned with a philosophy of life. He's concerned with a philosophy of life that says, if I live righteously, that will equal a long life. And he's dealing with that philosophy and saying, that's not a thing. If you give 10% of the Lord to the Lord every month faithfully, you will get 90% back or whatever their math is for these wealth and health. You know, it's this crazy math thing where if you give, then you get more than you gave, and it's, 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 it's math, and I don't want to play. But we tend to go with that. We tend to think like that. Trying to get prosperity, personal happiness, through strict observation of religious and wisdom principles. If I follow all the religious rules, then... Or I'll be happy, I'll be rich. All of my children will grow up and be perfect and they will all love Jesus. And, they will. and I... Yes, God is now obligated to make my life work out well. And I've seen really, really, really godly parents who have brought up kids that have gone completely off the rails. Of course, I've also seen the opposite. Absolute knucklehead parents who end up having a kid that loves Jesus and has done more for the work of the Lord than anything. And Solomon looked at all that and says, I don't get it. But we get this idea, we want this math equation. If I do this, I get this. And Solomon says, I gotta, I gotta get that philosophy out of your head. It ain't there. So what he's saying is don't be a fanatic. Rule following isn't going to dramatically alter what God has ordained for your life. What God has ordained for your life is what God has ordained for your life. And you 
just crazy following a bunch of religious rules aren't going to change that one way or the other. This really gets into some groups, my Catholic friends, some other folks that church, is it Church of Christ? Yeah. One of, they just have rules and rules, and then they have rules for their rules. <laughs> and Solomon says, that's nuts. The poor priest Get the that philosophy priest. out of your head. Yeah, it ain't going to do it. The one who just got kicked out of the church. The, the local Catholic church just had a big curve level this last week because a priest said a wrong word in baby baptism for 20 years, and now all those baptisms, according to the Vatican, are invalid. Yeah, it's like the <laughs> This crazy following of these rules is ridiculous. Solomon looked at that a long time ago and says, knock that off. No, I was going to say, I know that um, I read somewhere in the Bible, um, I, I don't know exactly where it was, but it was along the lines of, um, I forget now what I was trying to say with that, and I don't want to go off. All right. <laughs> Never mind. Um, likewise, verse 17 does not say that moderation, that sin in moderation is acceptable. Yeah. Verse 17, um, don't be excessively wicked. Don't be excessively wicked. You can be a little wicked. That's not what it's saying here. Uh, don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It doesn't say that moderation in sin is acceptable. It implies that while some sin in everyone's life is inevitable... Those who embrace evil as a way of life are destroyed by it. Those who say, well, that's, that's just the way I am. I'm a philanderer. <laughs> I philander. <laughs> that's, that's who I am. You know, I, just, I have to be me. I'm a thief. You know, I, just, I steal stuff. That's, just, that's who I am. That's my but truth. I but I, then I give 10% of it back. You know, our, our current, side note, IRS guidelines have a line on there for how much you've made looting, and you need, you're need you supposed to... What? Huh. What? What? They have a line in the current tax code for you to tell the IRS and pay taxes on how much stuff you have stolen. Because the government, while it says stealing is bad, we want our, our portion of what you stole. I'm not going there. I'm just throwing that as a side note because people say, you know, it's okay because, you know, everybody was doing it. The last four verses of this section, verses 19 to 22, we see two instructions. Well, in that, before I move on to that, it implies that those who embrace evil as a way of life will be destroyed by it. Absolutely. It's an absolute. Now, it may not be, Solomon's already said that sometimes we see people who live an evil life seem to lead a long life, but they will be destroyed by it. And if they're not destroyed here, when will that take place? At the judgment. At the judgment. You will be destroyed by it. Solomon said, it's a done thing. That is a set conclusion, and a wise person should consider that. The last four verses, 19 to 22, are two instructions, each with kind of an attached explanation. But they have to be understood in connection with each other. I'm going to kind of buzz through these because we're running short on time. I want to get finish it up because I'm scared to death of the last section. So I'm going to, I'm going to run through these. And then I'm going to brace myself for questions on the last section. So first off, wise people are necessary in society because human sin is universal. We need wise people to come along and say, that ain't right. This is dumb. You can't do that. Don't do that. Wisdom makes the wise man stronger than ten rulers of a city. And in verse 20, there is certainly no righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins. There's nobody. I believe Jesus said the same thing. <laughs> Rulers can try to curb evil by brute force. We've seen that recently. 
to our, our friends to the north, using absolute brute force, because of all the pettiness, weakness, ambition people bring into society, only the wise can maintain that equilibrium among them. To say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to get into some... Mo I'm, my moderation is, I realize that there is going to be sin. That's a thing. And everybody's going to be a part of it. But what can I do to make those good, godly decisions? Where can I be wise? And of course, the book of Psalms tells us, where does wisdom come from? It comes from the hand of God. And... It also tells us how does God hand out wisdom to those who ask. He says it's liberal. The idea is of pouring grain into a grain sack. And, and then the sack fills and it's flowing all over the place. That's the word picture in the words that are used there. So the wise will take all that into consideration and say, okay, how can I walk through this without going crazy on either side of this nonsense? Yes. So earlier when I was bringing something up, because you guys were talking about um, uh, a man's character and stuff and all that, and there is, a, it's out of debate who said this, but um, it says the uh, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Yeah. That I believe was from Abraham Lincoln, but of course those back to you now and now. Yeah. Like, so, but that was one that stood out to me during this class. Well, yeah, if you, want to, if you want to check a man's, or a person, I'm using man in the generic terms, give them power. Um, I used to deal with HOAs when I was on the community response squad. Man, you give somebody a little bit of power, all of a sudden you can see what their true nature is. Um, you give some, you know, I, Cindy and I always joke, we'll run into somebody like that at a store somewhere and see wow, that is the most powerful $15 an hour person I've ever seen. Because <laughs> they just... Uh, 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 uh. Verses 21 and 22, finishing up this section, are pretty easy to understand. Don't pay attention to everything people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know that many times you yourself have cursed others. The idea here is that Solomon wants the reader to understand and accept that everybody is a sinner and learn to deal with people as they are instead of trying to make somebody who we think they are or who we think they should be, who we want them to be. Realize that people are sinners. And guess how they're going to act? Like sinners. Like sinners including people who love Jesus and have been washed in the blood. And if I go home from church all frustrated and angry with a fellow believer, what have I failed to remember? What Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It should not be a surprise. All right, let me finish this up because we're running short. I'm going to read the last few verses, 23 to 29, because I'm scared to death of this section. I have tested all this by wisdom. I resolved I will be wise, but it was beyond me. What exists is beyond reach and very deep. Who can know it? I turned my thoughts to know and explore and seek wisdom and an explanation for things and to know that wickedness is stupidity and folly is madness and I find more bitter than death the woman who is a trap, her heart is a net, and her hands chains. The one who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Look, says the teacher, this I have discovered by adding one thing to another to find out the explanation, which my soul continuously searches for, but does not find. Among a thousand people I have found one true man, but among all these I have not found a true woman. Only see this. I have discovered that God made people upright, but they pursued many schemes. All right. In a class mostly of women that you now know why I'm such so afraid of this section. <laughs> Let me explain. 
<laughs> the concluding paragraph of chapter 7 is a confession of the impossibility of arriving at complete wisdom. I can't, if Solomon says, I can't get there, what does that mean for the rest of us? We We're not going to get there. In verse 3, the, we see the teacher's determination to understand human behavior, but he's come to the realization that wisdom is so far off and so deep that he's never going to be able to fully understand it all. He even wanted to clearly and fully understand the great evil of sin and all that wickedness and folly or madness, which is the very natural of the heart of people, and which exposed in the course, which is exposed in their life, in the course of their life, if you've got sin and folly in the core of your being, it's going to come out. But this too proved beyond him. He said, even trying to examine sin and how that works, that's just beyond me. Because wisdom, if you're a wise person, you should be able to, I'll just put sin behind me. I just won't do that anymore. <laughs> he said, I don't get it. Now, verses 26 to 28, after he examines that, appear to be utterly misogynistic, very anti-woman. But the reader has to consider two factors. First, this book was originally written for a male audience. But it's scripture. It's in God's ordained word. So we need to understand what's going on here. These verses, like we've already seen in previous chapters, look back. How many times so far has Solomon looked back to Genesis and the beginning of things? He's referred to it a bunch of times. So he's looking back yet again. And for him, 3,000 years ago, that wasn't too far back in history. That was probably less time from him to Adam than it is from us to Solomon. The portrayal of a woman as a snare and a trap does not refer to a prostitute. I've seen some people try to make it that. It refers to a domestic conflict between a husband and his wife as given from a man's perspective based on Genesis 3.16. And what did God say to Eve at that time? What did he tell her? Who was going to be the head of the household? But what did he say to Eve? What was going to be her attitude about that? You're going to try to control him. And what is that going to work out to be? There is going to be conflict. God said so from literally family one. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16. In other words, because of sin, married life will oftentimes be a war instead of a joy. Married couples, I'm not asking for an amen here. <laughs> but every married couple in here, or if you were married in the past, you know that at times you had discussions <laughs> with your spouse. And he said women will try to ensnare and control men because that's what he told Eve. Often through sheer force, though, men will dominate their wives, now making it miserable for everybody. So the teacher, Koleth, a man writing for men, looks at it from the masculine perspective that many men are made miserable by their wives trying to control them, and then they respond by being the loving person who loves their wife like Christ loved the church. By responding with sheer force and dominance. The man who is righteous before God, though, he says, escapes this fate. The second half of verse 26. The one who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner will be captured by her. 
not by never marrying, but that God gives this kind of man, who a woman who is loving and is not a trap. My youngest daughter, I, I heard this weekend, is fixing to get married. <laughs> and the young man and I will be having some discussions. <laughs> we will also be having a Bible study, the same one that I've gone through with my last two son-in-laws. I already know that this is, he's, he's a godly man, he's a Christian man, he loves the Lord. And he loves my daughter. But we're going to be talking about these very issues. Verse 28 doesn't mean that men are slightly better than women. Ladies, thumbs up. You agree? Yes. It describes the reality, though, that most men can find at least one man who is a true fan friend, but they oftentimes don't find the companionship of a woman that doesn't have at least some level of competition. I want to do it this way. <laughs> the right way. The right way. <laughs> way, you're good. Yes, honey. Yes, dear. <laughs> it's important. Now, let me close with this, because we're out of time. It's important to note that it's equally, equally possible to reflect on Genesis 3.16, the last part of that, from a woman's perspective. For many, with, for many women, a husband can be a hard, cold taskmaster. If he does not love his wife like Christ loved the church, he can be a very hard, very cold taskmaster. <laughs> for a while. Human history has no shortage of examples of emotional and physical brutality by men to their wives. Similarly, many women find at least one true female friend that they never find in a man who is to love them as Christ loved the church. So Solomon looks at that. Remember, he's a man, he's looking for the male perspective. But it's equally opportune. We can look at that exact same passage from the female perspective and say, you know what? I too have found this because my husband and I, even though I love my husband, love him to death, couldn't live without him. But there are times when we discuss the right way to do things. <laughs> this chapter concludes... This chapter has the concluding idea that people, men and women, have gone in search of schemes to put themselves on top, including in the bonds of a 30, 40, 50, 60 year marriage, still coming up with a scheme to make sure that my way is the right way. And it goes back to wisdom, what we already looked at. So again, how has the teacher shown us ourselves? Pretty much like holding up a mirror, has he not? So, now you can read that passage and say, Solomon isn't bashing women. He's looking at people from a marriage perspective and saying, I recognize the problems that are going to be there. And wisdom is still the best way to go. This is, like I said, this is the last chapter of Solomon looking at life. Starting next week, and you can read ahead in chapter 8, now through the rest of the book, through chapter 12, we just have four chapters to go, he's going to start now giving us practical ways 
to now take wisdom and bring it into our lives. So now we've had seven weeks of examining ourselves, and now he's going to say, okay, here's, here's the way to go. So let's, we can go with that. Beth Ann, would you close us this morning? Sure. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning We're grateful that we are able to gather to study and to share. We're thankful for all of Pastor Harry's uh, work that he's put into this, Father. And Father, we just ask that you would be with us as we go into worship, be with the message, be with the music, be with all of our hearts. Let us be the light. And it's your name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week. Amen.